Shabbat Shalom. Before I begin, I would like to thank the Best Sadiq Men's Club for giving me the honor of speaking to you all today. I'm here to talk about Jewish grassroots advocacy and why I believe it is the best antidote for combating the rising levels of anti-Semitism presently plaguing Canadian society. I first became familiar with the notion of Jewish grassroots advocacy when I began my career at B'nai B'rith Canada. I must admit, at first, I disliked the term. As I was pondering what to include in my remarks today, I had the opportunity to reflect on why this was the case. With the benefit of hindsight, I concluded that the reason was in fact fear. When I thought of grassroots movements, I thought of bus boycotts, orange t-shirts, and Occupy encampments. It was unnerving to accept that in the 2020s, despite all the profound contributions that the Jewish community has made to the betterment and advancement of Canadian society, that Canada's Jewry still had to advocate for itself in a manner that I associated with the plights of the disenfranchised and the marginalized. Any willful blindness or naivety has been removed due to my experiences as B'nai B'rith's Director of Research and Advocacy. I've come to understand that the fate of Canada's Jewish community rests solely in its own hands. As diasporic Jews, the reality is that our future will be secured only by ourselves. And grassroots advocacy is the tool we must utilize. But what does that even mean? Miriam Webster defines grassroots as the basic level of society or of an organization, especially as viewed in relation to a higher or more centralized position of power. Advocacy is defined as the act or process of supporting a cause or proposal. I'm no English teacher, but when you put these two words together, they form a complex noun. When you add the adjective Jewish, you get the following. The act or process of supporting a Jewish cause or proposal undertaken by the Jewish members of society and Jewish organizations, especially as viewed in relation to a higher or more centralized position of power. There is one component of this definition left to terse out. What constitutes the higher and more centralized position of power that juxtaposes the Jewish cohort of society and its organizations? It is my submission to you that in the Canadian context, this role is filled by our governments, corporations, and institutions. We may have allies and supporters, but recent events have made it abundantly clear that we cannot rely on anyone but ourselves to defend our rights to safeguard our well-being. I do a lot of work with the Kurdish community. There is a Kurdish saying that I believe is apropos to our situation. The Kurdish people, when describing their own precarious existence, often lament that the Kurds have no friends but the mountains. Now that we have unpacked what is meant by this phrase, uh, Jewish grassroots advocacy, we can explore what this looks like in action. Jewish scripture, Jewish scripture has provided us with a plethora of examples of Jewish people taking matters into their own hands to ensure the continued survival of their people. Rabbi, I apologize if any of the following is not a kosher interpretation. Recently, we celebrated the holiday of Purim. There is a lot to be learned from the narrative contained within the Megillah. One lesson is the example of grassroots advocacy practiced by Mordechai and Esther. When the Jews of Persia faced near certain state-sanctioned demise, Mordechai did not wait for outside intervention. He understood that only the Jews of Persia could save themselves, and he implored Esther to lobby the king. Esther courageously intervened, and the Jewish people lived on to face another threat to their existence. Soon we will celebrate Pesach. Sure, Moses spoke to burning bushes, but he was also a grassroots advocate. The Jews of Egypt could not rely on anyone but themselves to bring about their own freedom. Moses intervened, and the rest is well biblical history. Pesach reminds me of an international grassroots movement worth mentioning. The world may have forgotten about our hostages. The Israeli government may the Israeli government may have failed to obtain their release, but we, the Jewish people, will not be deterred. We will continue to advocate and to demand their release. We will protest in person, we will campaign online, we will wear yellow ribbons, we will wear hoodies, and we will not back down until they let our people go. Domestically, the recent efforts of B'nai B'rith Canada exemplify 
what it means for an organization to engage in grassroots advocacy. Late last year, the municipal government and police failed to take action to mitigate the threat of protests at the Avenue Road overpass, which were intimidating the local Jewish community. B'nai Bris stepped in. When it became clear that the authorities would not intervene on their own accord, on behalf of all Jews in Toronto and the Jewish community at large, we filed an application in court against the organizers of these rallies. Our intervention embarrassed the authorities and caused the police to ban future protests at the overpass in the interest of public safety. We filed in the wee hours of the morning and they released their statement the very next day. Now, imagine being the sh poor schmuck who stayed up all night working with counsel to draft affidavits and prepare submissions only to have their action rendered mute a few hours later. Several times over the last few years, Jewish students at McGill University have been prejudiced by anti-Semitic motions and referendums being brought forth by the student government. Sadly, the school's administration has failed to act. Even though the actions of the student union violate its memorandum of understanding with the university, refusing to allow the university to sit idly while Jewish students were ostracized for their Zionist beliefs, B'nai B'rith once again intervened. We are now engaged in two separate legal actions in Quebec to ensure that McGill and its student union are held accountable. Last month, a member of the federal NDP tabled a problematic motion in the House of Commons. This motion had the propensity to further embolden and inflame anti-Israel radicals responsible for instigating a horrid wave of anti-Semitism. Understanding that our parliamentarians were failing to address the matter appropriately, B'nai B'rith spurned into action. On behalf of the Jewish community, we grouped together over 50 leaders from across the spectrum of Canadian society and released a joint statement which was sent to every MP. Sadly, we could not prevent the motion from being passed. However, we were able to send a strong message to our lawmakers on behalf of Canadian Jewry. Following a B'nai investigation, we were able to determine that an anti-Semitic newspaper, which regularly contains articles promoting terrorism and denying the Holocaust, was being distributed at a grocery store owned by Metro Inc. On behalf of the Jewish community, we wrote to the company. Not only were we successful in having the publication removed from that specific store, we obtained an, an assurance that the, pub, that the publication would be banned from all their stores across the country. A separate B'nai investigation revealed that items that made a mockery of the Holocaust were available for purchase on Amazon Canada's website. Uncovering this had a truly profound effect upon myself, and it is an experience I will never forget and would like to share with you today. It actually started with Walmart. Walmart Canada had for sale on its website through a third party what was advertised as a beach blanket. The only issue is that it was actually a talus, complete with sitzit and embroidered Hebrew inscriptions. Upon being made aware of this, B'nai B'rith immediately reached out to Walmart to demand its removal. To their credit, Walmart acted immediately and removed the item from its online shopping system. The Walmart debacle, as it has become known around the office, had spurred the curiosity of our research team. We audited Amazon, and sure enough, there were taluses for sale on Amazon that were misrepresented as either beach towels or sun shawls. However, I had a terrible ominous hunch and asked my team to search for phrases related to the Holocaust on Amazon. The results contained the books and documentary films you'd expect them to. They also contained portraits of Hitler, canvas prints of emaciated victims of Nazi concentration camps, and wall stickers containing images of the gates of Auschwitz I, the latter marketed as the perfect uh, item for your kitchen or bedroom. Perhaps even more distressing than the results of our investigation was the lack of response to Benebris' multiple attempts to, comment, to contact Amazon to facilitate the immediate removal of these disgusting items. Not to be deterred, B'nai B'rith collaborated with the Friends of Simon Wiesenthal Center in Liberation 75 to undertake a public campaign demanding that Amazon take action to remove the items. Eventually, following our concerted effort, they obliged. It should be noted that Amazon Canada remains a problem. Presently, on both the French and English sites, one can purchase a copy of The Thorn in the Carnation. What is The Thorn in the Carnation? Well, it's the most recent work of aspiring offer 
sorry, of aspiring author and Hamas's chief in the Gaza Strip, Yahya Sinwar. Rest assured, B'nai B'rith Canada has already formally engaged Amazon to ensure the removal of this smut from its site, and we will not relent until it is gone. Just last week, another one of our investigations exposed an individual in Quebec who was a known anti-Semite and who we believe presented a genuine threat to both the Jewish and greater community. Unfortunately, the police were not monitoring this individual. Thankfully, B'nai B'rith was. As a result, we were able to liaise with law enforcement to successfully mitigate the potential threat. Next week, B'nai B'rith will appear before the provincial legislature's standing committee on social policy to make a submission on Bill 166, which is the province's act to amend the Ministry Training Colleges and Universities Act. The purpose of our appearance at Queen's Park will be to demand that the province take immediate measures to hold its post-secondary institutions accountable for their inaction when it comes to ensuring that all of Ontario's campuses remain safe spaces for all their students, including Jewish ones. We will also be imploring the committee to recommend amendments that will help to facilitate the adoption of the International Holocaust Remembrance Alliance's definition of anti-Semitism by every university and college in Ontario, because no one, let me repeat, no one, but the Jewish community gets to decide what is and is not anti-Semitic. These are just a few of the recent and upcoming examples of how B'nai B'rith has and will continue to serve as a voice and advocate for the Jewish community in Canada. Whether it is in court, in parliament, in the media, on campuses, or anywhere else, when societal leaders and stakeholders fail to properly ensure the protection and the advancement of the best interests of Canadian Jews, we will be there to fill the void. We can cultivate expertise and develop resources to enable our ability to defend our community from the odious scourge of anti-Semitism, but we cannot do so alone. If we return to our definition of grassroots advocacy, you will recall that it refers to the basic level of society and organizations. To ensure the longevity and continued prospering of our community requires the work of each and every one of us. We cannot afford for any of our voices to be silent. Silence and apathy will be our downfall. For far too long, too many of us have been afraid to fly our metaphorical Jewish flag. Our detractors want us to be silent and complicit. If we have one fault of our religion, uh, ethnicity, ethnoculture, or whatever it is you like to call us, it is that we have, at least in the Western world, mastered the art of assimilation. We must be both mem proud members of Canadian society and loud and proud Jews. This is how you, as an individual diasporic Jew, can engage in grassroots Jewish advocacy. Wear your Star of David, display your mezuzah and other Judaica, and never be afraid to tell the world who you are. The feeling that you cannot do so, or that it is wrong to do so, is a problem in and of itself. Ben Freeman, the Scottish Jewish academic, describes it as internalized anti-Semitism. Just because hateful and intolerant people don't want you to be outwardly Jewish, just because they would rather that we be silent and hide our chutzpah, does not make it right. I would like to conclude by telling you a brief story. Just yesterday, I got a call from my brother. I am very proud of my younger brother. He has become an amazing young lawyer and works in-house in the equity department of a major bank. He called me because of something that had happened the night prior. He was at the bar with one of his major clients, someone who respected him and who he had a good working relationship with. Somehow the conversation drifted into the realm of religion, which is always a bad idea at a bar. My brother, naturally, said that he was a Jew. It is important to provide you with a bit of context. My brother is a handsome young lad with blonde hair and blue eyes and the last name Robertson. Often he gets mistaken for a Gentile. He told me that when his client found out that he was in fact Jewish, his mood changed and he became instantly hostile. What my brother said next broke my heart. He said, Rich, I almost wish I had never told him I was Jewish. 
My response to my brother is the reason why I wanted to share this story with you all today. If someone is bothered by your being Jewish, the problem is with them, not you. They are a worthless bigot. Never again means never again will we be afraid to be proud of who we are. Am Yisrael Chai, thank you.